Hello, everybody. This is Ralph Martin, the CEO of RJ Quality Consulting. And in today's video, I want to talk about ISO 17025 non-conforming work uh, as it pertains to Section 7.10 of the ISO IEC 17025 standard. Um, I, I wrote this article on ISO 17025 non-conforming work, managing and correcting deviations in the laboratory. And uh, you could just click on the link in the description box of this video if you're watching it on YouTube or if you're watching it on this page. Feel free to read all of the details um, regarding non-conforming work. I'm not going to read the article for you in this video. I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about non-conforming work. Um, it is an important uh, element of the standard and um, one of the things I like to do when I talk about required elements of the standard is to go to the standard itself and look at the requirements of the standard and talk about how the laboratories shall uh, meet the requirements of the standard and to more importantly uh, manage their quality management system more effectively using the uh, requirements under Section 710 of Nonconforming Work in ISO 17025. So what I'll do is kind of pull up the uh, standard here. I'm on section 7.10 and this is one of about I think 10 areas, actually nine specific areas and one uh, not so specific areas where the standard requires a procedure right you you notice up here at 7101 the laboratory shall have a procedure so um like i said so there's nine areas of iso 17025 where there are required procedures where you'll see the laboratory shall have a procedure for dot 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 and that procedure shall include a through h or whatever um and and there are nine of those in throughout the standard and then there's one um that's actually customer complaints where it says the laboratory shall have a written process for customer complaints so in a sense there are 10 required procedures under iso 17025 and this happens to be one of those required procedures so it is a shall statement it's a big deal if and the, the reason i i bring shall statements up in standards um, is that if you are seeking laboratory accreditation to iso 17025 or you are already accredited to ISO 17025 and you are um, susceptible to external audits by your uh, accreditation body or registrar, um, one of the things you don't want is a major nonconformance. A major nonconformance is defined by most accreditation bodies as an absence of a clause element. So in the case where there is a say no procedure that would by definition be a lack of you know a clause element or a complete absence of that requirement so that would entail a major nonconformance and the problem with major nonconformance is is most accreditation bodies use that as a guide to say the laboratory is not ready for this audit we may have to reschedule it and that could be a bad thing um, uh, or you know they start they start getting weird and they start pulling threads on other areas that lead to multiple nonconformities, and that's just not a good place to be. So my emphasis is the fact that you shall have a procedure for, and that procedure shall include these uh, requirements A through F. So one of the things that I have found as an auditor, so uh, many of you know that I am an ISO 17025 registered auditor or certified auditor. I do audit um, ISO 17025 on behalf of a very large accreditation company. And uh, I've also audited ISO 9001 companies uh, for registrars and um, I'm currently doing ISO 17025 audits and also ISO 17020 for the inspection world. Uh, it's a different standard, but it's very similar to ISO 17025. So nonconforming work is a area where there are actually uh, one of the things that I have found in my auditing is there are some common nonconformities that occur. One of those being when something in the environmental conditions 
aspect of the laboratory is out of spec. And the auditor will say, oh, I noticed the temperature requirement was off that day. Uh, let me see your non-conformance. Oh, well, I don't have one. Well, if you look here, laboratory shall have a procedure that shall be implemented when any aspect of its laboratory activities or the results of this work do not conform to its own procedures or the agreed requirements of the customer e.g equipment or environmental conditions or out of specified limits auditors love to hit this one because it's an example in the standard and that's typically what they look for are examples there are actually other areas of the standards where we we find the same thing and, and i would like to kind of i'll skip a little bit in the standard but i wanted to capture these things because these in the area of non-conforming work if you miss one of these things you will get a non-conformity in this section of the standard another section is section 6.4.9 if i go to that section of the standard 6.4.9 Um, equipment that has been subjected to overloading or mishandling gives questionable results or has been shown to be defective or outside specified requirements shall be taken out of service. It shall be isolated to prevent its use or clearly labeled or marked as being out of service until it has been identified to perform correctly. The laboratory shall examine. This is another shall statement. Be careful of those. The laboratory shall examine the effect of the defect or deviation from the specified requirements and shall, the shall statement, initiate the management of non-conforming work procedures, see section 710. So if you have a piece of equipment that gives questionable results or gives you a bad result, boom, non-conformity shall be written, right? If you don't have that and an auditor sees a bad calibration result or a bad equipment failure, and he asks you for a non-conformance and you don't have one, don't be surprised when he gives you a non-conformance. It's pretty clear in the standard that you need to write one. Another area of the standard that you see this in is in section 7.7 um, when it talks about validity of test results. So let's go to section 7.7. Um, ensuring the validity of test results, specifically 773. And I usually do videos on each of these sections of the standards. So you can always subscribe to my YouTube channel and or read my blog and you'll you'll see areas where I specifically talk about different clause elements of the standard and get more granular with those to, to help you out. That's really the whole point here. Um, but section 7.7.3. Data from monitoring activities shall be analyzed, used to control, and if applicable, improve the laboratory's activities. If the results of the analysis of data from monitoring activities, like a QC monitoring chart, are found to be outside predefined criteria, appropriate action shall be taken to prevent incorrect results from being reported. So if you're looking at like a control chart for you know, and you have upper and lower control limits set for, say, QC monitoring, and you exceed upper control limit or go below a lower control limit, boom, non-conforming work. You write it up <laughs> and then, you know, talk about why it is out of non-conformance. It could be something as simple as, you know, the thermometer didn't give me the right reading because it broke. And corrective action or correction is to fix it or buy a new one, right? End of story, closed. Um, that's what non-conforming work is. Typically, the difference between non-conforming work and corrective action is that, um, and, and I'll actually get right to what the standard says about that, 710, we'll go back to non-conforming work. Um, so first of all, I'll answer that question, then I'll move on. I know I'm scattering here, but it, it's all in good good faith here because it's helping you out. So section 710.3, where the evaluation indicates that the non-conforming work could recur or that there is doubt about the conformity of the laboratory's operation from its own management system, the laboratory shall implement corrective action. And what they mean by corrective action is section 87 of the standard corrective action. So what's the difference between non-conforming work and corrective action? If there is evidence that the problem could recur. 
meaning that there's evidence that the problem could recur. Not like, well, it could recur. I mean, you know, things happen. I don't mean that. I mean that there's evidence that the problem could recur. Then the root cause analysis needs to be performed so that you can correct the problem addressing the root cause. That's what corrective action means. Corrective action addresses the root cause of a problem. Correction fixes a problem. That's the difference between non-conforming work and corrective action. It's pretty basic, right? Um, you know, like I said, uh, now here's an example for you GC lovers out there. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm walking down, I'm in the lab, I'm supervising the lab, and, or, or first of all, I, I'm running an analysis on a GC, and I get a bad baseline or a bad result. And I do my troubleshooting and I find out that the reason I have a bad result or a bad, you know, baseline is off is because there's this big old hole in the septum that I injected the sample into. Well, that tells me why I got a bad result. So I changed the septum and I corrected the problem. No big deal. I mean, this kind of stuff happens. Septums get old. They, they have holes in them big old gaping holes and that introduces air into the GC and you know it can cause a bad baseline. So my non-conforming work is I got a bad baseline, uh, cause is bad septum, a correction, replace septum. Okay. End of story. I'm assuming the septum's bad for whatever reason. But then the next day um, I'm walking through the lab and I noticed an analyst doing exactly the same thing I did yesterday, <laughs> right? They troubleshooted, they saw a problem. And before I stop the person, I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder why they're having the same problem. I changed that septum yesterday. Either I have a bad septum or a bad lot of septums or something else is going on. That, because there's something else going on, that means there's evidence that the non-conforming work could recur. That means I need to do an investigation to find out why this that happened again. Because, you know, having, ha having that happen twice in a row is either a coincidence or there's a trend of something going wrong. But let's take that a step further. So I don't say anything and I watch the analyst change the septum. And he changes the septum and he just cranks the, the, that nut after he changes the septums. He cranks it really, really, really tight. Well, because I'm an expert GC user, I know that could bend or mutilate septums. So next time somebody goes to inject a sample into the GC, guess what? Big old gaping hole. Okay, so now the root cause of the problem is no longer a bad septum. The root cause of the problem is... I have an analyst who doesn't know how to change set, change septums properly. So the root cause of the problem is I have an analyst who doesn't know how to change septums properly. Corrective action is train analysts on how to change septum. Um, to prevent this from reoccurring, maybe I ought to train all the analysts just in case other people don't know how to change a septum, right? That would be the difference between non-conforming work and corrective action as it pertains to section 7.10 of the standard versus section 8.7 of the standard. So the requirements for non-conforming work are that you shall have a procedure and that procedure shall ensure that A through F and, and this is basically that you have responsible people that are defined within your procedure who uh, can authorize non-conforming work and who are authorized to either halt work or resume work once the problem's fixed, that that is defined in the procedure and that the, an evaluation is made of the significance of the nonconformance, including some sort of impact analysis to see if it impacted previously done results. Like did the nonconforming work cause or did it impact maybe past analysis that I've already delivered to the customer? 
That's what C would entail. And then a decision taken on the acceptability of the non-conforming work. Are we going to accept this as is, or are we going to fix it and then <clears throat> reevaluate that? And then where necessary, do we need to uh, notify the customer or recall any test results that were done? And then the responsibility for authorizing the resumption of work once we've corrected the problem. And then also to retain records of non-conforming work. It is required that you record non-conforming work. It says the laboratory shall retain records of non-conforming work and actions specified um, to deal with section seven, you know, uh, B through F here. And then have somewhere in the procedure where it talks about where the evaluation indicates that the non-conforming work could reoccur, which is what we talked about before, um, and then that we escalate that to corrective action. So those are the requirements of non-conforming work. Um, and you can, like I said, read the article to get the details of some of the other great things about non-conforming work. And should you have any questions about anything related to quality, you can always leave a comment below this article. And if you need help with ISO 17025 accreditation and would like a free consultation, go ahead and click the link below this video somewhere on this page, and you could book a free 45-minute consultation with me. Uh, and I can uh, help you out and uh, provide any consultation that you would like, or if you would like me to help you become accredited to ISO 17025, feel free to book an appointment with me. One advantage of using uh, RJ uh, Quality Consulting is I'm not a large firm. I'm, I'm very reasonable in my rates. I guarantee that I can be at least 25% lower than any other consulting company that you see on the internet. Um, a lot of times, and I won't say the names, but there are quality consulting firms that actually hire me to be their consultant, and then you end up paying twice. They pay my salary, and then they pay whatever that um, consulting company is charging. Or you can just go directly to me, and you'll get a better rate. Um, uh, and also, um, I can meet any company's budget. So, and I guarantee... If you want accreditation, I guarantee that you will get the accreditation certificate or all of your money back. So book an appointment. We can go over the details. And uh, this is Ralph Martin signing off. You make it a great day.